Hey everyone, Pastor Brian here. So glad that you've joined us today for our first ever online service that we're calling CEFC Anywhere. We are genuinely excited about this opportunity despite the circumstances in which it is taking place where we have the opportunity to continue to be the church and be the body of Christ despite the fact that we can't gather together physically because we recognize that the church really isn't about a building anyway. And so we're gonna take some time to sing together, to hear a message from Pastor Phil. We're really hoping that this can be as similar as we can to what we would be doing if we were gathering together on a Sunday morning. And we really hope the result is that you would be able to take whatever your next step closer to Jesus is. Because even though we can't gather together right now, the mission that we have as a church to see people take their next step closer to Jesus remains. And that's the goal of what we're doing this morning. And so lean in, uh, engage in whatever God wants to do in your heart this morning as you encounter and relate to and connect with your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Hey everybody, I'm Pete, and we're excited to be with you guys. If you're jumping in online uh, for the first time here at CEFC, we're excited to do that with you. And you know, if you're just coming in from somewhere else in the country or wherever you are, if you're at home or you're with somebody else at their house, we're just excited to have you guys join us this morning. Listen, we're gonna sing some worship songs, and we'd love for you guys to join us as we do. And I know it's awkward, because clearly you're in your house or something like that. Um, but we wanna create an opportunity for you guys to connect with your Heavenly Father, who we believe loves you guys so much. And um, even though we're not meeting together corporately, um, we're meeting together with our hearts with you today. So we're going to jump in and we invite you to sing with us. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemy. I raise a hallelujah Louder than the unbelief I raise a hallelujah My weapon is a melody I raise a hallelujah comes to fight for me. Take it, Shana. I'm going to sing in the middle of this storm. Louder and louder, you're going to hear my praises roar. Up from the ashes, hope will arise. Death is defeated, the King is
sing a little louder. 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 In the presence of my enemies. Sing a little louder. Sing a little louder than the unbelief. Sing a little
the good Shana, thanks for singing that with us. Guys, uh, it's great to be with you, like I said. And if I, if I didn't say my name, my name is Pete, and this is Caleb. What's up, everybody? Caleb, this yeah. is Pete. Yeah, and this is Caleb. And that's Pete yeah. also. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's awesome, like I said, to be with you guys. Listen, I know that these are troubling times that we're living in right now in America. I mean, they really are. Yeah, it feels like every conversation that you and I have, Pete, we start talking about something good, like your kids or my wife or yep. something awesome like that, and then it suddenly devolves into the apocalypse. <laughs> I don't know how it gets there, but it really does. <laughs> it really actually does. Yeah, he's not kidding. Um, the truth of it is, though, there's a lot that we could be afraid of in the world um, because the reality is, not even in just times like this, there's all kinds of like mini apocalypses that happen in our life all the time. You were just telling me this story about something that happened with you. Tell me that. Yeah, this was hilarious. So my wife, Nicole, uh, and I, we both got to serve at the, uh, the youth retreat that we had the other weekend. Uh, it, was, it was super good. But my wife is so much more intelligent than I am. Let me tell it's you. It's true. Uh, it's true. <laughs> but we live like eight minutes away from here, which is where we were sleeping over the night. So my wife very intelligently decided to sleep at home while I stayed here. With all those youths, let me tell you, it was. So you stayed with the students here, and yes. your wife went home. And I didn't sleep, and my wife went home, and she slept through the <laughs> I get night. it. But in the morning, anyway, I had to go home. I got a shower. I'm not gonna freaking not shower in between. <laughs> uh, and I go home. You know, the lights are all off. She's still asleep. It's early in the morning. I'm walking around, getting myself a little snack, uh -huh. get myself a shower. You know, all that stuff. Then I put my head into the bedroom to see if she's awake, and she's got her head like just over the covers like this. And she goes. <laughs> Oh my goodness, thank goodness it's you. I thought it was some intruder. And I was like, wait, you thought that some intruder came in, they could, broke themselves through the door, uh -huh. and they walked around, got themselves a snack, got, took a shower, and you just like sat in the bed and didn't do anything about it? <laughs> but it's so funny, because she was like, she was too scared, right? Mm -hmm. And so many things happen in our life so often where something that, that maybe we should or shouldn't be afraid of, it paralyzes us, we can't do anything, we're just stuck where we are. Yeah. Yeah, it reminds me of this parable, and I think the reason why Jesus told parables is because they were stories, and people relate with stories. Yeah. Um, he told this parable about uh, the idea that you could build your life, you could build your house on sand. Mm -hmm. Sand's not a great place to build your, build your house or build your life. I've never built a house, but... I've built a sand house, and I've watched them wash away. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's not a great place to build your life or your house. Uh, because it's not a great place to build a foundation. But the reality is, Jesus' love is a good place to build your foundation. And it's something that, um, as Shana was just singing about, all my life you've been faithful. When we build our lives on Jesus' love, it's something that is faithful. It's something that stays true. Um, his promises are true. And so we're going to sing this next song, which I really love. This song is called Build My Life. It's an excellent song. Yeah. And it talks about that concept of building our life on the love that Jesus has for us. And we encourage you guys to lean into that this morning. Um, so let's sing it together and shout it in your houses together. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring 
You're worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. You're worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Oh, Jesus Jesus, the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever see. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you.
Jesus, we're thankful for what you've done in all of us, that you create a safe place for us to know you, that when we lean into your love, we can find our hope, and we can find a way to live, a way that's better than the rest of the world living without you. Because when we live our life with you, we put you first, but not just you, we put others first because of the love that you've given for us. Jesus, I pray that in these times, we'll place our eyes focused on you because of all that you've done for us and the example you've set for us. Let us live our lives of love and build them on the love that you've given for us. It's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Thanks for being with us, everybody. We really hope that you were encouraged and uplifted by that time of worship and that you were able to engage in that time of worship wherever it is that you are engaging with this video. And we just want to take a moment again to thank you so much for your support of this ministry. You support us through your time and through your giving financially. In fact, just yesterday we had some people who gave of their time to chop firewood for those who can't afford it or either can't chop firewood for themselves so that they'll be able to stay warm next winter. Your continued generosity is something that blows us away on a regular basis. And we would love for you to continue in that. There are some ways that you can do that since we're not meeting together physically. The first is that we're having normal office hours right now uh, during the normal business time. So you could drop your physical gift, whether that be cash or a check off at the office, or you could mail those things to us at the address at the bottom of the screen here. Or maybe you would consider giving online, which is a really simple process to do that. In order to start that process, all you have to do is click on the link that is in the post above this video. But however you decide to continue to give, we just want to thank you ahead of time for that because it not only supports the ministry here, but supports us as a staff. And so we are so thankful for that. Why don't we transition now into a time of hearing what God has to say to us through Pastor Phil and his message. So glad to have you here with us. Uh, we know that it's a little bit of a wild time, pretty tumultuous out there, pretty crazy. Um, these are definitely some uncharted waters for us, I think for us as a nation, for our world, uh, things that we've not experienced before. But we want to take a time to just speak into your life some hope uh, and some potential. You know, I, I was thinking about with all the uncertainty and all the unrest, it just feels like the opposite of the Christmas season out there. Um, in in C.S. Lewis's book, The Chronicles of Narnia, he wrote this. He says, it's always winter, but never Christmas. And I think the statement he was trying to make is that there's this gloom and the dreariness of, of winter, but never Christmas, never the joy that comes in the middle of that season. And for me right now, it feels like it's Black Friday every day. Uh, but not Black Friday because it's great deals, but Black Friday because everybody's really selfish and thinking only about themselves and going crazy and nuts. And, and, and we, th we feel like this is really a time that our faith is tested. And this is a time where the things that we say in the arenas of comfort are really put to the test. So it's easy for us when it's comfortable to say we should serve and we should sacrifice and we should love. But when everything gets chaotic and we're in a position where that sacrifice or that service maybe is detrimental to us or could be concerning to us, what are we going to do? Um, this is a time where I think we can easily revert to a survival of the fittest mentality. It could become a dog-eat-dog -dog world. But the question that I want to ask is what will the church be in this moment in history? What will we do? as the church, and how will we respond? You know, I think that 
what we believe or say that we believe is put to the test in this moment. Our faith is challenged. And really, I see great potential. In the season that we're in, I see great potential. I see potential for us to grow in our trust in God, to grow in our faith. Uh, For some of you, it's the potential to spend more time with family, with everything going on. All of the excuses, I I hear guys all the time saying, I need to spend more time with my kids, more time with my wife. Well, now you've been given no excuse. Maybe you have more opportunity to do that, so let's do that. It's funny to me when I think about it, the CDC made a comment recently that there should be no gatherings more than five, which obviously they don't know most of our families because that's just your kids playing in the backyard. Um, So... We just, we have opportunity, I think, to spend time with one another. I think we have opportunity uh, to do something as the church. As Pastor Brian shared early in the week, you think about the Roman Empire and the early church in the Roman Empire. When plagues were hitting uh, their cities, when natural, natural disasters were hitting their cities, the church did something. The church stuck around. The church cared for people. So I just wonder what potential exists for us as the church. I think there's potential for us to grow in our faith, to grow in our knowledge of God, to spend more time with Him. Um, and I believe there's potential for the gospel, for the good news of Jesus Christ to be proclaimed. And so really what I want us to do is to shift the way we think in this, to kind of step away from the panic and step away from all of the things that's going on around us and start thinking about the potential to look away from the obstacles that are in front of us and start thinking about what opportunities exist for us to share the gospel with others, to reach into the lives of others. I I was considering, as Paul wrote to the church in Philippi, he was in prison and he says to them, don't see my chains as as an obstacle. Really, they're an opportunity. They're an opportunity not only for the gospel to spread here in prison, but now the gospel has spread into Caesar's own household. And so I I want us to shift. And my hope is that our minds would shift from from the panic to the potential, from the obstacle to the opportunity, and that in this season we would live full rather than being taken captive. So we're going to dive into Colossians chapter 2. We're going to keep walking through our study, uh, our series on identity. We're going to be in Colossians chapter 2, verse 8 through 15. And I want you to notice what Paul says. He says in verse 8, See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition, and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. Paul challenges us to make sure we're not taken captive. And he says, don't be taken captive by hollow and deceptive philosophy. He wasn't opposed to philosophy in and of itself. He wasn't opposed to the pursuit of knowledge and wisdom and understanding. What he was opposed to was philosophy that was empty and hollow and in contrast to the certainties that we know in Jesus Christ. He he was opposed to this idea that was being pushed to the Colossians that Jesus wasn't enough. They needed more. They needed to reach some level of enlightenment, some level of uh, greater standing or greater knowledge. And what he's saying is that those things are empty. They're deceptive. Christ is all and everything we need is in him. And he challenges them to not be caught up in those deceptive philosophies. And I wonder for us, particularly in this season of life, what deceptive and hollow philosophies might take us captive? You know, when, when things are comfortable, we, we get caught up with what we should look like or what we should have and all these deceptive things that the world throws at us. But now we find ourselves maybe getting captured by more philosophies of fear, philosophies of am I going to make it? Do I have enough to survive? Some of us maybe have fears of dying in this situation. Others, I think, have fear of living, of wanting to go on in such a world if they don't know what the world is going to look like. And we can easily be taken captive. And notice that Paul says, see to it that nobody takes you captive. He's saying that we have the ability to either live free or to be taken captive, literally to be kidnapped or carried off. We choose, unlike any other situation, we choose whether we will be taken captive or we'll live in freedom. And I've been playing with this idea, I kind of wanted to to share it, that 
You know, what if in all of the, the empty philosophies that our world sends us, all the things that it says we should gravitate towards, we should hold on to, it's our hope, it's our trust, that we would look at it and say, no thanks, I'm full. That we would be able to look at deceptive and hollow, empty things and say, no thanks, I'm full. I have everything that I need. And notice what Paul goes on to say. He shows us that we are full. We don't need to be taken captive because of, of Jesus Christ. In verse 9, he writes, for in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. I, I think Pastor Brian did an excellent job a few weeks back talking about the fullness of God in Jesus Christ. That he was fully God and fully man. If you get a chance, and most of us, we have time to do it, go back and check that out. It's, it, it, he, he just really displayed that well, what it meant to be fully God and fully man. And Paul is writing here that all the fullness of God, everything that was God, everything that is God dwelled in Jesus Christ. Christ. He was the fullness of God. And then he goes on to say, and in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. So the fullness of God is in him, and he is in us, or we are in him. Therefore, we are full. We have everything that we need. We're complete. Paul is challenging this idea that they needed something more. And he's saying to them, no, in Christ, we have everything that we can possibly need. And in that, he uses Two, uh, two forms of imagery, I think, to, to show that connection that we have with Jesus Christ. The first is circumcision. He goes on, he says in verse 11, In him you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self, ruled by the flesh, was put off when you were circumcised by Christ. And he's looking and he's saying, okay, we understand, and they understood, that within the history of Israel... And their forefather Abraham, God had given them the sign of circumcision to show that they were children of Abraham. And so Paul is saying, okay, there was that system, that structure. And he understood that the Jewish religious leaders were sort of pushing them to adopt circumcision, to say, okay, yeah, you believe in Jesus, but that's not quite enough. Also get circumcised to truly be children of God. And Paul, much like he does, if you want to read it, read the, the, his letter to the Galatians. He argues that Jesus has done something through faith that transcends human circumcision. He says there, he writes in, in Galatians, he says that, Abraham was given a promise that through his seed, God would not only bless his nation, but all the nations to come. And, and Paul will argue that that seed was Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ became the blessing to all the nations, not only the Israelites, but to also us who are non-Jews. And what Paul is saying here is that we have experienced a divine interaction. He says, through Jesus, your whole self ruled by the flesh was put off. Not by human hands, something that we couldn't do. God removed our self that was once ruled by the flesh. Now notice he doesn't say the flesh is gone. But what he's saying is that we are no longer ruled by it. We now, through Jesus Christ, have the opportunity to overcome the flesh and overcome sin. He says, goes on and says, having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. He uses this symbol of baptism. And, and we believe and we, we understand that in Jesus' call for us to come to faith, he says, go and teach all those, uh, making them disciples and baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. That baptism is one of those first steps that we take in response to Christ. But I don't think that's what Paul's talking about here. He's not talking about because you were actually physically immersed in water, you identify with Christ. He's speaking about our immersion in Jesus. He's saying that because you were immersed through faith in Jesus, when he died, you died. When he came back to life, you came back to life. He's speaking of a reality that exists for us. Pastor Brian's going to dive into it next week. Well, Paul will go on and show and speak of a future reality for us as if it's already occurred. And the reason he does that is because he believes that we were in Christ when Christ did what he did. All that he is, we are. And all that is his becomes ours as well. He's using these images to show 
we are connected with Christ, and since Christ has all the fullness of God and we are in Him, we are full. And through it, He shows what I believe are certainties that we can have through faith in Jesus Christ. He goes on and says and reveals certain certainties. The first is life. He says, when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. We have a certainty in all the uncertainty of this world that through faith in Jesus Christ, we have life. You know, make no mistake, you and I were dead in our sins. We we're not just lost. We were not just mistaken. We didn't just have failures. We were, we were dead in our sins. But through faith in Jesus Christ, we have been made alive. And Jesus says, and no matter what you experience, you will live even if you die. He says, all those who believe in me will live even if they die. So we have this, this truth, this certainty, that no matter what happens around us, no matter where the world is headed, no matter where we are headed, if we believe in Jesus, we have life, even if we face death. We have forgiveness he goes on and says, for he forgave us all our sins. Because we are in Jesus, we know that our sins are forgiven. They're cast as far as, uh, as, far as the east is from the west. We know that our past, our present, and our future sins are forgiven. And tied into that, we have canceled debts. He says, in connection to the forgiveness of sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness which stood against us, he canceled the debt that we had. He took that debt and he wiped it clean. You know, I think right now so many people are worried about how they're going to pay their bills. They're worried about their, their 401ks and their retirement plans and all these different things. And, and you know what? I don't have answers for those things. But what I do know is that in Christ, my, sin of de- my, my debt of sin is paid. The reality is that no matter what, this, this payment that I couldn't make myself, Jesus has made for me. He says, we have freedom from condemnation. Having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness which stood against us, he has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. It was believed that when somebody was crucified, they would often take a list of their crimes and nail that to the cross. And as you read the story of Jesus' crucifixion, what you find is that the only thing they could nail to his cross was he was the king of the Jews. There was no crime that he committed There was no sin in his life, but he took our crime, our sin, and not only nailed it by nailing a sign to a cross, he nailed it to a cross by nailing his own hands and feet to a cross. He took that price that we had to pay. One of the things I was thinking of doing if we could be together was having out in the lobby a cross and giving each of you a little card that said something like, my certificate of debt. And that as we would leave, you would take that certificate of uh, of debt and take a hammer and take a nail and nail it to that cross as sort of an indication of Christ has already done this for me. You know, we don't get that chance, but maybe you do that yourself. You know, maybe you make your own card or maybe you write down some things that you feel you're still indebted to God for. And you take that, go outside, find a tree, you know, it's your, if, you're, if it's your neighbor's, borrow it. I don't know. Find something and, and go nail that and reflect on it and say, my sin, my debt is canceled. It's been nailed to the cross. Jesus has paid it. That's the certainty that we hold. And we have a certainty of victory. Paul goes on and says, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. You know, the whole world thought they had defeated Christ. The whole display of the cross was a mockery of him. Not only did they mock him by spitting in his face and ripping his beard, they mocked him with their words. They mocked him as he carried that cross up the hill. They mocked him just with the cross itself, hanging him naked on display in front of everybody else. And the whole world thought he was defeated. And the evil spiritual forces thought he was defeated. But what Jesus would do is he would take the very thing that they thought was mocking him and use it to bring victory to all those who believe. This symbol, this cross that was an instrument of execution 
would become a symbol of hope for all those who believe in Jesus. It would become something that we tattoo on our arms or we wear on our necks or we display on our walls. That it goes from being this thing that the Jews thought was a curse, shameful, that the Romans wouldn't even talk about to becoming a symbol of hope, something that we declare. He says that Jesus disarmed the powers and authorities and he made a public, public spectacle of them, triumphing over them, that through the cross, Jesus gave us a victory that no matter what happens in our life, we know because he triumphed, we triumph. And so my question is, what will we be and what will we look like as a church in this moment in history? Will we live full? Will we grab hold of the fullness that is ours in Christ Jesus and live in it? Or will we live empty? Because if we live empty, we're going to panic like everybody else. We're going to run around in all kinds of insecurities, being frantic, being selfish, being cruel, losing all sense of civility. But what would it look like if we as the church decided that as all the world is being caught up in deceptive and hollow philosophies, we say, no thanks, I'm full. And we live in that fullness and spill out that fullness into the lives of other people. I believe that there is a potential for us to be standing on the other side of this thing, looking at what God has done through His church and in His church, looking at what God has done in our own personal lives, looking at what God has done in the lives of those around us. But the start is us changing a perspective from panic to potential, from obstacle to opportunity, from captivity to freedom. And I believe that there are ways that we can do that. Some way, here are some ways I was just thinking about, and maybe you guys can, can share with us others that you come up with, but here are some ideas that I was thinking of, ways we can live full rather than empty. One is the, those three ideas that I shared earlier in the sermon, sacrifice, serve, and love. Those things are the things that are put to the test in this moment. Will you really sacrifice when it's actually going to cost you something? Are you willing to serve even if it might mean your detriment? Are you really willing to love people in all of the chaos and all of the mess? Second, consider others. And this is a time and these seasons in life that can be very easy to, in pushing us towards uh, circling the wagons and focusing only on ourselves and worrying about how we're going to survive. And, and I think in this time, it's a great opportunity for us to just consider other people. Maybe for those who are young and healthy, and perhaps have a very loose view of what's going on, consider those who are not. Consider those who maybe are more susceptible. Consider those who uh, have a little bit more concern and doubt. Um, let's not make this Black Friday. Let's not turn every day into that. Let's be more considerate, considerate of those around you. Uh, third, call someone who is alone. You know, it, we've really been wrestling through how do we do this? How do we reach into the lives of people when we're told don't be around people, avoid everyone? You know, I was talking to a young guy the other day and he was saying that it's, it's almost easier when there would be like a natural disaster or something like that because then you just take food to people and you take water to people. But in a situation like this where everyone's saying, don't talk to people, don't go near people, don't touch people, uh, how do we interact and how do we care for people? Well, I think get on the phone, talk to someone. And consider somebody who maybe is alone. It doesn't just have to be an older person. It could be somebody who doesn't have a lot of friends or family around and give them a call. Let them know that they're not alone. You know, we are in this together. It's our opportunity to, to say to one another, I got you. We're in this together. Uh, stay connected through the tools that you have. Uh, polo each other, FaceTime each other, whatever. You know, we, we complain about social media tools and how it, it distracts us from seeing each other eye to eye, but they actually can, in moments like this, become great, great tools to be used to connect with other people. For some of you, you hate when people call you. You hate getting on the phone. All right. Send a text, but, but you know, I, I've been calling people all week long. It's been really fun for me to just talk on a phone. It's forced people to have to talk to me because I know they can't hide. I know they're home, uh, so they have to answer the phone. So I get a chance to call them and talk. Call somebody. Give them, give them a call. And I want to say this. Call us. 
You know, if you guys are you're wrestling through things, you're, you kind of want to know what's going on, give us a call. Uh, call us in the office. I'll tell you my cell phone number, 717-383-7032. And I will screen your call. I'll let you know that. I'm going to screen your call. Uh, but if you leave a message, I'll give you a call back. Typically, I call back. Um, but we're here. We want to chat with you guys. You know, if you're just wrestling through things, or you just want to hear some, a, a common voice, give us a call. We'd love to talk with you. Uh, stay connected. Stay connected with other people. Uh, five, meet the needs where you can. Obviously, we can't connect in, in physical ways all the time, but maybe you have an elderly neighbor that you threw their ring doorbell or something can say, hey, can I go get you some groceries? Meet, meet needs where you can. You know, if there are people in your life that you know this is a tough time for them, perhaps they're out of work or they're struggling, find ways to care for them financially. Help them walk through this. You know, I, I think about in, in all of our pursuits, we can be really self-focused, but we have great potential and opportunity to show people we're not afraid and we're willing to share and we're willing to do things. And that leads to another one, share, share rather than hoard. You know, if you have what you need, Jesus, when he, when he challenged us to pray, he said, give us this day our daily bread. And if you have what you need today, share freely with other people. Um, share with those who have an, a need. Go beyond and, and trust. I, I think this is a time where our trust in God is tested by fire. Do we truly believe when Jesus says that he will feed the sparrows, he'll feed us, he will clothe the flowers, he'll clothe us? Do we truly believe that? And are we willing to say, you know what, I don't need to hoard. I can share with others. I can take what I need for my daily bread and I can share with others. And then here's, I think, the last but most important show people the fullness of Jesus Christ. This is not only a great opportunity for the church to show its kindness and care, it's the greatest opportunity for the church to reveal the gospel of Jesus Christ. To share with people the fullness that we have. You know, in all the uncertainty, there's something that is certain, that one day Christ is coming again. And when He does, He will restore all that is wrong. And when He does, we will, be, we will go to be with Him and we will inherit all that is His. And we have a hope that transcends our country, transcends a virus, transcends this life. And this is a great opportunity for us to share with others the hope that we have, the good news of Jesus Christ. And I just want to say, maybe you're tuning in, and you're not a member of our church, and maybe you don't believe what we believe. Here, here's the truth of what we hold. Jesus Christ came, to pay the penalty for our sins, to take those sins and to nail them to a cross. And Jesus Christ came back to life to offer us a new life. And we know that no matter what happens in our world, no matter what is to come, we have life in Jesus Christ. And you can know that too. That if you maybe just in this moment would say, God, I believe in the death of your son and his resurrection and I entrust my life to you that you too can have a hope that transcends no matter what we face. Here's the truth. I don't know what the future holds today, but I didn't know what the future held back in January either. And I didn't know what the future held back in 2019. Nothing has changed. But there is a future reality that I, I do know, that through faith in Jesus Christ, I will inherit the kingdom of God and everything that is wrong in my world will be made right. And it's that truth that should lead me to live full rather than empty. You know, last weekend, many of you know, my wife and I, we traveled down to Maryland to spend some time uh, with her family because of the passing of her Aunt Joyce. And it was really, to me, a celebration of her life. Joyce had served in her church for 35 plus years. She had led children's ministry. She had led vacation Bible schools, summer camps. She had done all these things. And she just, her life was just pouring out into other people. Joyce was one of the, one of the most generous people we had ever known. You know, often she would be ill or she'd be struggling with something herself, but she never focused on herself. She never got caught up in her own needs. She still, even sometimes to her detriment, would pour out into the lives of other people. And she knew that the God who took her sins and nailed them to a cross, 
The God who had forgiven her debts, the God who had, had, had taken all of those things away would also be her victory. And that one day she would be in his presence. And as I think about her life, I pray that when my life comes to an end, we're all, we all face that, that when I do, it'll be said that I lived life full, not empty. That I gave and poured out and served and sacrificed and loved, not that I was selfish, not that I was consumed with me or lost in the empty, hollow, deceptive philosophies of this world. You know, as I, as I think about it, my heart, my concern is far more than how much hand sanitizer I have. My concern is that we as the church would share the greatest news of Jesus Christ because here's the reality. We can have all the toilet paper and hand sanitizer in the world and still be lost and empty in the deceptive philosophies of this world if we don't come to know Jesus Christ and pursue Him. So my encouragement to you guys as a church, to those who have put their faith in Jesus Christ, is to live full. You, know, as you find yourself, maybe throughout this week, there are going to be moments where deceptive hollow philosophies are coming at you and you're finding yourself wanting to gravitate towards them. You're finding yourself being carried away or taken captive. My encouragement is that in it you would just scream out, no thanks, I'm full, and that you would live in the fullness of Jesus Christ rather than the emptiness of this deceptive world. Let me pray for you guys. God, I thank you so much for your love for us, for the certainties that we have in Jesus Christ. I thank you that you have forgiven our sins and canceled our debt, You've wiped them away, cast them as far as the east is from the west. I thank you that you have given us a victory, you've allowed us to triumph over our greatest enemy, which is death. But I pray for our church in this season, in this moment of history, that we would do something great, much like the early church in the early Roman Empire. But I ask that you would stir in us to find ways to be creative and innovative, to reach into the lives of other people, to show them a hope that transcends this virus, that transcends this country, that transcends this life, that we would explain and declare that to those around us. I pray if there's somebody listening in who... Maybe they're caught up in fear. and They're wondering what the future holds. I ask that in this moment, they would take a step towards a certain future. A future that is with you in your kingdom and in your inheritance. That they, through faith, would say, God, I believe in your son, Jesus Christ, and I entrust my life to him. And we will continue to look for opportunities to serve, to love, to sacrifice. We pray that you will give us the strength and the means through your Holy Spirit to do it. And I ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. We really hope that this video brought some normalcy during these times for you. We really hope it was a great opportunity for you to connect with Jesus. We really want you to not give up on connecting with others during this time either. Uh, we understand the social distancing things that are going on and why those are a good thing for our society right now, but we don't want that to cause you to give up on community either. So make sure that you're still establishing those community connections, whether through digital means like FaceTime or Skype or things like that, or even by using the guidelines that we've been given for how those interactions can happen safely and for the good of our society right now. We also wanna hear from you. We wanna know how you're doing, how we can support you in that, so you can feel free to call the office if you need someone to talk to. You can email us via the contact page on our website. If you need someone to pray for you or you have a prayer request that you would like the body to be praying for, you can send those to prayer at mycefc.org or if you're open to, you can just comment on this video publicly for everyone to see it. We wanna be able to be the body of Christ and maintain as much community as we can during this time. And in order to do that, we wanna be able to support you in this time as well. And so keep an eye on our social media, especially our Facebook page for continued content throughout the week to help you take your next step closer to Jesus when we can't be together 
during this time. And I just know that I really miss you guys. I miss being able to get together with you. I love you guys. I'm so encouraged by you on a regular basis. And so I want you to know that I'm praying for you. I want to ask you to be praying for me and to be praying for all of us as a church as we go through this time. And I'm just looking forward to when we're through this and our Savior brings all of us to the point of remembering that um, he's bigger than all of this that's going on. And so my hope is that I will see you guys sooner rather than later. Until then, we'll catch you back here next week.